Welcome and thank you for watching our YouTube channel. Remember, subscribe and hit the notification bell. You don't want to miss anything. Do you hear that clicking sound? That's you clicking and subscribing and hitting the notification bell. Yeah. Ding, ding, <laughs> ding. Do it today. Now. Bye. Today my message is called the triumphal entry. The triumphal entry. We're going to talk about this today because it's a special time in the calendar of God. You know, Palm Sunday marked the beginning of the week that is also known as Holy Week. And during this last week of his ministry on earth, Jesus deliberately fulfilled messianic prophecies. We're not going to go through the Old Testament and, and point those out, but Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 is one of those you can look at a little later. But all four of the Gospels record this triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And this was actually an enacted parable. You know, Jesus told parables with his words, but here he is, he acted it out. And it was a dramatic way for him to proclaim his messiahship. And that's, we're going to read about this in Mark chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 1 through 9 in the King James Version of the Bible today. And how many Bibles I have in the house? Let me see. You know, it's, it's so good to see that, that y'all put the word of God first place. We'll start reading in verse 1. It says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereupon never a man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you? Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. You see, the fact that the colt had never been ridden is of a special significance. Objects that were used for sacred purposes must never have been used for any other reason. So Jesus had a specific plan in mind when he gave these instructions to his disciples that day, those two. You know, sometimes God gives us things to do that seem difficult. I mean, can you imagine they just walking out? He gave them a word of knowledge. He knew exactly where that donkey was. He knew who owned it. And he gave them words for, and he gave them instructions and they were obedient to that. You see, they, let's, verse 4 continues to say, And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without, in a place where the two ways met. And they loosed him. You see, obedience to the word enables you to do whatsoever God has called you to do. This was not the time for them to, to chat about or second guess the words of Jesus. And that's what so often that we do. God tells us to do something and we, want, we take the time to pause and second guess about it. I mean, so often when God has called Jesse and I to give something, he wants to get that seed in the ground just like even that minute if I can. So I remember him telling me, Kathy, I want to send so much money to this person. And I was in the middle of something else. I said, yeah, I'll do it later. He's, no, no, stop, do it right now. Sometimes I, I used to get really aggravated with him when he would act like that. But I've learned that we have to be obedient and do exactly what God says and when he says it. There was a reason for it because as soon as it was released out of our hands, abundance was destined for us. Amen. Well, as soon as we obey, and when we, if it's to pray, if it's to expect, if it's to go and read a scripture, God has a purpose in mind for that. Amen? You see, obedience to the word enables you to do whatsoever God has called you to do. There's never anything that God has called you to do that you cannot fulfill if you'll just obey him. But when we get into uh, an area where we want to, to second guess it, then we lose out on the grace. We lose out on the power. We lose out on that anointing, that pathway that was already available for us to walk in that place. All of a sudden comes weeds and, and, and uh, difficulties come in. But when we're obedient to step out and do what God has called us to do, it changes everything. It makes a pathway. Amen. I remember I was talking with a church member here that came up for prayer for their uh, business. And uh, I remember speaking and declaring that new things were going to be opening up. And the very next day, something that was closed before opened up. 
He's saying that when you, when you go to someone to pray, you have to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to guide your words and to, so that you can speak things that need to be spoken. Amen. And then when that happens, it, it ushers in like a domino effect and things start beginning to come to pass. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. Verse 5 goes on to say, And certain of them that stood there said unto him, Now this was the owner of the colt, I'm sure. What do ye, loosening the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus has commanded, and they let them go. You see, faith always acts on what you believe, and it propels you toward your next level. Amen. These people who allowed the, the, the colt to be used were propelled, I believe, to a next level because they were obedient. Faith always acts on what you believe and propels you toward your next level. These disciples saw something nobody else of that day saw. They saw Jesus' words come to pass as they walked it out. And then when they walked it out, they were able to be used by him for this beautiful day when uh, tr the, uh, Jesus would walk, well, would, would go in on a donkey, and the donkey would walk him into that Jerusalem that day. You see, faith always acts on what you believe and propels you towards your next level. I read a story one time about how Napoleon's horse got away from him. A quick-thinking private jumped on his own horse to capture the general's horse. And when he returned, he presented the reins to Napoleon. The ruler took them and smiled at, him, at the private and said, Thank you, Captain. Think about that. The soldier's eyes widened, it said, at what he had heard. Then he straightened up, saluted, and he snapped and said, Thank you, sir. He immediately went to his barracks, gathered his belongings, and moved into the officer's quarters. He took his private uniform and, and, uh, to the quartermaster and exchanged it for a uniform of a captain. You see, he believed the word of the general, and he embraced his new position. God is calling so many of you to step into that new position, and he has called you and spoken things to you that you need to take the time to embrace. He has called you blessed. He has called you healed. He has called you strong. He has called you uh, anointed with the Holy Ghost to speak his word. He has positioned you that way. And when he calls, your response should be, yes, sir. And you begin to make plans and put things in a position to walk in that new level of authority. Amen? You see, faith always acts on what you believe. And it always will propel you toward your next level. So many people are ra praying, Lord, push me up to the next level, but they're not watching for that opportunity. Yeah. They see the opportunity and they shrink back. Sometimes they're, they even read it in the Word where God has told them what really belongs to them, but they shrink back because it seems too good to be true. No, instead of that, you need to be preparing your house. You need to go exchange your rags for His beautiful coat of righteousness. Yeah. Amen? He sees you as his glorified one, the one who already is a brand new creation, not subject to the, the problems of this world. He sees you as an overcomer because he was more than a conqueror and he made you a conqueror right alongside of him. Amen. Let's continue reading in verse 7. You see, they brought the colt to Jesus. It says, And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon them, upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. You see, this was the custom in the ancient world to honor a new king in this way. And I know a lot around here, we have some palms and different types of palms. I could have brought all of those, but y'all understand what this all means. This was a symbolic act that they really took the time to recognize that this was a, con a king that needed to be honored. John's gospel tells us that the tree branches that the people placed on the road before Jesus were actually palm branches. And a palm branch symbolizes victory. It symbolizes joy and also salvation. So there's something about this Palm Sunday. Every time you hear the word Palm Sunday, you should think victory. Yes, he was, he was on the donkey. It didn't look, you know, sometimes people think that, oh, well, he should have been on a war horse. No, he was on exactly what God called him to be on. 
And he, wa- he came into that, that j- city of Jerusalem that day, the king of kings. Even though there was a lot that was still ahead of him on the road. And the same way is so true for us. It should be a, a, a great example to us that we're walking this road. And, and even though things may not come to pass exactly the way we think it should come to pass, at the moment that we think it should come to pass, we have to realize that God always has a plan. And if we stay on the road, and st- you know, he could have just got off because there was a lot of different voices of that day. But he st- stayed on there because he only did what his father told him to do. He only said what his father told him to say. And we need to follow his example. Verse 9 It says, and they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I love that. They were shouting in the streets for him, crying out. You see, all of this happened during a strategic moment when the great Passover festival was about to begin. Jews came to Jerusalem from all over the Roman world during this week-long celebration to remember the great exodus from Egypt. Notice the scripture says they went before and they followed crying Hosanna. Notice that. You see, Hosanna means save now. And some of your translations that you're reading here may say that even. And it came to be a customary shout, sort of like hallelujah, save now. And they were all honoring Jesus as Messiah. They were actually quoting a portion of the Messianic Psalm 118. And they were publicly acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. Well, who could have been, think about this for a moment, who could have been in that great triumphal entry parade? And we know about parades over here in South Louisiana. Who could have been in that great parade on that first Palm Sunday? It was a crowd of people. Well, there were three types of people there that day in the crowd. Number one, the curious. Number two, the resentful. Number three, the faithful. The curious came from Jerusalem after hearing about Jesus raising Jesus, raise, excuse me, raising Lazarus from the dead. That was all they were talking about. They had heard about it. In fact, they heard about it, and that's why they were walking out of Jerusalem going towards Bethany, when Jesus was already on that donkey walking toward Jerusalem. They encountered Jesus on that donkey, but they also encountered a crowd of people that were with him. So the curious came out to see this great sight. I mean, it wasn't every day that you heard about somebody being raised from the dead. There were three that were raised from the dead in the earthly ministry of Jesus. The, the, the son of uh, the widow of Nain, the daughter of Jairus and Lazarus. Now, the the daughter uh, uh, of of Jairus had been dead uh, maybe a day. They had just thought, some thought she was still alive. They were in the room. They could have said, oh, well, just a day. Maybe she really wasn't dead. uh, Even the, the son of the widow of Nain could have just been a day or so. They could have tried to dismiss that, but Lazarus, was in the grave four days. Could not dispute the miracle that had happened that day. Rumors had heard, they wanted to see this. This must be the Messiah. Let's go and watch, let's go see. They were curious and they came out. You know, today people are still curious about your faith. They see the life you live and they see you coming to church or maybe they hear about it or maybe you tell them. And they're curious. Our life needs to be an example to let them know that God is real on the earth today changes our lives amen he is worth living for he's a good God but the curious are a whole group of people now the resentful were the religious leaders that were envious of the crowds that followed Jesus the Bible tells us that it was for envy that they crucified Christ they didn't like the idea that everybody was following them and listening to them they they, they didn't want to lose their power and we see that a lot in this country we live in and actually in the world. There's so many people that are drunk with power and they want to control all of society. And they don't have enough brains to control their own life. Yet they want to try to control us. We need to stand up and realize that the Spirit of God will not let that happen if we'll stand our ground. Amen? The resentful religious leaders were in the crowd. 
They were the ones that were talking amongst themselves in another gospel uh, rendition of, or story telling of this beautiful event. It talks about they were talking to themselves. Says, Look what's happened to them. The whole world is going after these guys. They didn't want to lose their power. So the curious came, the resentful came, and then the faithful were there. The faithful that followed Jesus from Bethany. They were a wonderful group of people. I like to think about who might have been in that crowd. Of course, there were close friends of Jesus. That was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We hear a lot about them, how they were the very close friends of Jesus. He spent a lot of time with them. I love the story of Mary. Actually, Mary is the one who broke that costly one whole year's worth of salary perfume bottle to anoint Jesus. And this also happened before the triumphal entry. And they, they didn't, the, the resentful were there too. Even though one of the resentful was in, on his team, the disciples, Judas said, why is she doing this? Doesn't she know that this was, could have helped the poor people? We didn't, she didn't have to pour it on Jesus. You see, the resentful resented Jesus. They didn't honor him. That happened that day. But Mary honored God. The other one that might have been following Jesus in the crowd were the disciples of Jesus, the true disciples. And there also were people that encountered Jesus along the way that were forever changed. I just want us to think about some of those people who they may be and just think about the great miracles. We're not going to turn to all of those, but there are so many examples of the miracles that Jesus did while he walked the earth. I would love, I like to think that some of those were in the crowd that day. I'm telling you what, if Jesus would have been the one, if I would have been the woman with the issue of blood that was pressing through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment, and I had been having that difficult problem for like 12 years, and I had all of a sudden been healed, I don't think I'd have left his side one minute. I think I'd have been in that crowd that day and, and, and just following him and, and seeing what he was doing. In fact, the Bible tells us that there were many women that supported Jesus' ministry that helped him. And they were probably a lot of those in the crowd that day. Of course, we know Lazarus was there. He left. They left Bethany and went into Jerusalem with a purpose, and he was there. We, we talked a little bit about him. We talked a little bit about Jairus' daughter, how she was raised to life. I think some, Jairus might have been there, don't you think? Still telling everybody, come and see a man. He raised my daughter from the dead. See, he, he was a witness. Each one of these people were a witness to the goodness of God. They were a witness to the power of God. And their voice needed to be heard. You see, it's so many, I don't ever want it to be said that Jesus walked there alone. I wanted to know, I want people to know that there's a, there's a whole host of witnesses here in this church that walk with Jesus and say that he is definitely the Lord of our life. Amen. There was also the blind men that Jesus gave sight to. I mean, we could sit here all day and go chapter and verse and read all the different people that were impacted by Jesus. These were the faithful that must have followed him and that, that their lives were a living testimony of his goodness. There was the widow I talked about where her son raised, her son was raised from the death. That was the widow of Unain. And then there was the leper that was cleansed. Think about that. Leper that was cleansed. He actually cleansed so many of them. There was one, there was 10 of them. And remember that there was one that turned around to thank him. And Jesus said, well, where are the nine? But only one was made whole. They may not have been the 10 that day, but that one, I bet you that one was right there in the crowd. Shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. What does it mean to come in the name of the Lord? That means you come representing all that that name represents. That means that he is here. He is here to offer salvation the day when free favors abundantly are supplied. Amen. Jesus said when he came into the to the uh, temples, he would say, or to the synagogues, he would say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Amen? Amen. To, to bring healing and deliver those that are oppressed. And he says, and also to declare the day when the free favors of God uh, profusely abound. Amen. This was the day. This was that Hosanna day. We are still in this day. The day began when he came, but it's still here. We're in the last of the last days. 
just as Jesus on that day was in his last week, we are probably in the last of the last days before Jesus comes back for his church. And he's still looking to see who's in the crowd. Who's in the crowd that is shouting, Jesus is Lord of my life. You may not be in a physical parade. You may not be in a physical street on that way into Jerusalem, but your life is on the road that you put it on. If you make a decision, I'm going to put my life on a road where Jesus is telling me to walk, then you are his voice in the earth. You are one of those witnesses. Hallelujah. I say, Lord, make me a good witness. I want to be heard loud and clear. I don't want the devil to misunderstand this when I tell him, you get your hand off of my family. I am the redeemed of the Lord as well. Hallelujah. You see, you need to be talking to some things. Your mountain needs to hear your voice and not a whisper. If you were, built, you were uh, preparing a beautiful dinner, and I don't cook a whole lot and set up the table like I used to, but I have done it, so I'm qualified to speak about it. Doesn't mean I got to do it every day. I've been cooking a lot lately, really. I made a gumbo last weekend. Big old 16-quart gumbo, put 10 quarts away in the freezer. Love it. I actually decided to start cleaning out some of my freezer, and I noticed this beautiful half leftover ham with a beautiful bone in it that's still in my freezer from last Christmas. I said, I got to do something with that. But it's too big for one meal, so I made a big old pot of cabbage with that ham, and the other half made white beans. My goodness, it's so good. We make you lick your lips and slap your grandma, as they say. I prove I can cook. My husband had a big smile on his face. See, what we do, we travel so much, we like to put things in small quart size or half quart sizes and pull it out of the freezer and, and cook it up. But the freezer's getting bare, so I need to do some stuff. But it's so good to know that you can do that. And uh, I've even thought of some other things that I can make. And put away because I enjoyed seeing a smile on his face. You know, God enjoys doing things for us. And I, I know that because I enjoy doing things for my family and for my husband. And it's such a blessing to be able to do that. But you know, when you prepare a beautiful plate uh, dinner, maybe if your table seats six or ten, whatever it is that it sits, and you put out all the dishes and you make it nice, you know, throw away the plastic plates. Who wants plastic when you cooked? If I take the time to, to, to take the cobwebs out of my pot, I'm not putting a plastic plate on my table. Uh-uh. We're going to do this thing right. And so I remember putting the whole set and the table out and plate, the, pl uh, the pl tablecloth, the dishes, the flatware, the glasses, napkins, and the food getting ready to go on the table. I remember there were times when I'd put the food on the middle of the table. Sometimes I'd put it to the side and you'd buffet style it. But I remember, if, I would think that if I set that all up and all of a sudden it's beautiful and something, something happens that the door to my house might open up and maybe a pack of dogs might come through the door. You think I'd say, oh, why don't y'all get out? Why don't y'all just, y'all shouldn't do that. No, you're going to be screaming and doing what you can to get them out of there and kick them out and then lock the door behind them. You see, you're going to do what needs to be done. That, that's just a natural reaction. Well, I want you to learn to draw upon the spirit of God that's within you and draw upon that spirit that, that re resists the devil and tells him to flee. Instead of letting him run rough, rough shot over you, taking everything that belongs to you, you need to stand up and take it back in the name of Jesus. Amen? God does that. God wants us to know that he is here to heal us and to touch us and help us to receive everything that he came to give to us. Amen? Amen? So many people were probably in that crowd. The demonac, demon, demonacs, demons of Gadara. You've heard of those guys. Some uh, translation says there were two. Some uh, teach, tellings of it tells there one. I believe that their one was worse than the other. That's why they talk about that one. But they were, the demons were in them, tormenting them. That, that They were bound with chains, but they were set free, totally healed. Of course, the people in the town didn't like it. They were one of those that rejected him, those scorners, the resentful. And they told him to get out of town because they were upset because they lost their hogs. But the, the one who was delivered was not upset. He wanted to follow Jesus and, 
And the Bible says that he told him, no, you go tell your family what you have seen. Let them see how your life has been changed. Let them do that. And the Bible says that he went and he went to all of the cities of Decapolis. I believe he became an evangelist for Jesus and he totally transformed that whole, whole region. I believe some of those people were in the crowd as well. I tell you what, I want to be at the forefront of that crowd. I don't want to be in the back sitting down, you know, tying shoelaces or, you know, just doing something ridiculous when Jesus comes on the scene. We don't want to miss our day of visitation. Amen. Amen. I just want to end with one person that might have been in the crowd. I'm not going to go there and read about it, but you heard about that woman. They call her the Syrophoenician woman. She came and to his disciples and begged them, please help my daughter. She's grievously tormented with the devil. And the disciples told her, get rid of her. She keeps bothering us. You see, they had an opportunity to do what they saw Jesus do time and time again. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. We need to be ready because God is going to be sending people to us that have needs in their life, that need to have, that need answers. And God, we have to realize that we are the light of the world here on this earth. The light of God shines through us, not just for ourselves, but so others can see their way to their victory as well. As well. See, when Jesus, uh, when she said, Master, my daughter is grievously tormented, please help her. I'm just going to paraphrase it. And he says, he says that, that the food is for the, not for the dogs. And she says, she wasn't offended. She says, well, even the little puppies under the table eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Such a beautiful heart that refused to be offended. And Jesus was marveled at her faith, and her daughter was whole and healed at that very moment. So you see, there were people in that crowd like this woman who could have been a castaway, who had just wasn't even part of the, the, uh, the nation of Israel, but she knew, heard about this wonderful Jesus, and she pressed in and got a miracle for her family. A lot of us are in a position that we need to, we're the, we're the standers. We're the gap placement people. We're the people that are in that gap for our family that doesn't know God. Here she was in the gap for her daughter, and her daughter was totally healed that day. She was one of those, I believe, or people, many of those. There were so many things that Jesus did. The Bible tells us that had, if, the, if they would have been written down, all the things that he did, all of the books in the world could not have held the works of Jesus. We're going to find out about all those works when we get to heaven. But you know what? He's still doing those great works. Our theme for this year is go do the work. He's still doing works in the earth today, and he's doing it through you. He's doing it through me. He's doing it through his church. And he's calling us to step it up and realize that it's time for us to, to let our light shine because that crowd needs to be surrounding Jesus. They need to know that Jesus is here on the scene. And we need to be proclaiming, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When the name of the Lord is declared, demons have to flee. When the name of the Lord is declared, sickness has to go away. When the name of the Lord is declared, it changes everything. Amen? God is so good. He does that. Let's turn to Psalms 118, verse 19, for our, first, for our closing scriptures. You know, I began the service by reading the first three verses of this passage. And I'm going to read that part, plus I'm going to go on down to uh, maybe 28. And because this was the proclamation of the people during the triumphal entry of Jesus that was taken from this psalm. They, they, you'll recognize it when I get there. Verse 19 says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord unto which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. I love that passage of Scripture. I often quote that verse when something happens in my life. You know, this is what God's doing. And, and he's the one who's getting the glory. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful. It's marvelous. It's glorious 
in our eyes. Verse 24 says, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. Hosanna, it's what it really means. I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. That's that blessing word. Verse 26 says, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. Palm Sunday is a celebration of the, the coming King, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That day when he walked, he came into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, the people threw their clothing in, on, the, on the donkey, but then they also threw it on the road in front of him. They threw the palm branches on the road in front of him to make to honor him and try to let him know that they respected him and knew that he was the Lord, he was the king, amen, and they wanted to honor him with their words. We honor Jesus with our lives. Amen. We honor him by saying, Lord, come into my life, forgive me of my sins. I want to live for you. We recognize that all this world is just a vapor, but when we have him, we have everything. Amen. He is the one that makes a difference. He makes a way where there is no way. He is the one that will show us the, the light when the darkness tries to surround us and crowd us out. He is the one who gives us life when the devil tries to put death into our mouth. Amen? He's the one who shows us how to pray when the enemy comes against us one way. God shows us how to speak to him and command him to leave seven ways. God has empowered you with his supernatural spirit to help you to live on the earth the way he did when he was here. We're not out here all by ourselves. God himself is walking through us. Let him, let him do what he wants to do in your life. Let him raise you up and bring you to that next level. Obey him when he tells you to do something, even if it seems odd. Even if it seems, oh, I've tried it that way. It never worked that way right before, but his spirit is on it. Sometimes we move ahead of God and do something that he's calling us to do, but we don't take the, we don't, we're not in the right timing. Timing is so important. Jesus could have walked, should, could have told him to get that donkey anytime. No, it was at that very moment, that Sunday, that began the Holy Week because he wanted the whole world to know. He wanted all of them to know that he was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says, I am who I am, who I am. He was and shall be. Amen. God is so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.